Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, my friend? It's a little wonderful. hope everyone else is having a fantastic day or night, depending on where you're listening from. Uh, it's going good, man. Doing a lot of home projects still. This I'm morphing my house into a mansion, I guess. I'm not sure what's going on over here, but I just can't get enough of home improvements, I guess. I'm not sure, but business is going good. Um, and yeah, my personal life is can't couldn't be better. Um, so everything's going well. How about you? How's it going over there? Uh, it's going great, man. Really, and 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 for those of you guys who don't know, Jeff does. He's a he's a he does like home projects, and he's done. He's made this house look really great. And obviously, with his construction background, he he just finds ways to improve stuff here and there. You know, I, I it's really cool to see what you're doing at, at home. I definitely need to get, uh, you know, a little bit better about uh, doing some of the projects in my home. But uh, you know. But overall, everything else is going real well. You know, uh, yeah. you know, we're still finalizing everything for the wedding coming up here at the end of the year. Um, and, you know, everything else is going really, really well. And similar to you, personal life couldn't be better. And uh, just trying to finish out uh, the rest of the year uh, strong so that we can really make a big impact in 2023, uh, which is what, uh, you, know, you know, I'm looking forward to. But speaking of just having a phenomenal impact and just a phenomenal conversation, I really don't. Uh, you know, think that I can un I underestimate what the conversation that we had today with uh, Sayo Kamara. Uh, he's a senior associate at Cushman and Wakefield in New York City. Uh, just an impressive individual uh, with a with a very uh, in interesting background. So one of the things we talked about when we first got started in the podcast interview is you know, how he got started in the commercial real estate industry. He had no really idea of what the commercial real estate industry was and just so happened to meet an individual uh, while he was, you know, waiting tables in, in his local market in Texas and, you know, an opportunity presented himself and, you know, he's got this strong drive to succeed. And he just decided to, you know, pack up his bags and bring his, his four bags and his dog. And he moved to New York city and, you know, the rest is history. So, you know, just the determination that this gentleman has is quite impressive. Um, you know, we, another thing we talked about during the podcast episode is some of the early struggles he faced as he's is looking to establish himself with a commercial real estate business. Obviously New York city is, is, a, is a different beast altogether. And so we kind of talked about some of the things that were unique about his experiences in the city. Along with that, we touched on what his specialization is, which is the office real estate sector. Uh, and we touched on some of the things that he's seen as far as you know, the evolution of the office market in a post COVID world and where he sees it going and some of the ways that, you know, employers can, you know, maintain, uh, you know, a strong workforce by maybe shifting around how they, you know, structure the workday so that they can maintain, you know, people, you know, within their workforce and also get them back into the office. And so it was a really interesting conversation on that front. And then finally, we touched on some of the philanthropic efforts that he, he takes on, you know, he's very passionate about a variety of different initiatives. And so we were able to learn a little bit more about, you know, some of the initiatives he's, he's kind of championed and, you know, continues to support uh, over the course of his career. And then also we touched on the, the diversity uh, piece as well, like how we're, we're going to be able to improve diversity within the industry, because as we, as many of us know that the industry itself is not the most diverse, but there are a lot of leaders within the industry that are really showcasing their leadership by stepping out and, and, and making an impact in that realm as well. So I think that, you know, this was a very insightful conversation. You know, Sio's a, a, just a great, great individual. I'm looking forward to keeping in touch with him. And, you know, I think you guys will gain a lot of insights from this particular podcast episode. Jeff, do you think you'd like to add anything? Uh, no, he just great guys seem like, and uh, I just really enjoyed seeing his passion come through for, uh, all the organizations that uh, nonprofits and stuff that he deals with and uh, just the value that he knows giving back to that, it, what it's going to transpire. And I can't wait for you guys to hear all that. Um, in the meantime, I've been saying this quite a bit at the beginning of the podcast is 
Uh, this podcast is free, but we have a price, and that's just recommending the show to a, a fellow colleague or a friend or anyone you feel like would benefit to our show. Uh, also, if you want to recommend someone uh, to actually be on the show, that would be great if you contact Raphael or myself, um, and we can uh, send you an application. You guys can fill it out, or we can send it to whoever you want uh, to to uh, come on the show. We would love to have them and discuss uh, their uh, interest in commercial real estate. So wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely, you know, agree. And then we're obviously very honored by the fact that you guys continually sure. continue to engage with the podcast. And, you know, one of the biggest gifts you could possibly give us is to share the episode with other people. Yeah. Obviously, the reason why we do this on a regular basis is because we want to reach the broadest audience possible so that we can be of service. I mean, that's that's part of the, yeah. the reason why we created this podcast is we wanted to make sure that we were able to impact, uh, you know, a broad audience to so that they understand uh, you know, essentially the, the logic is, you know, de de demystifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. So that is yeah. our objective with the podcast and you're helping that objective would be to share uh, the podcast episode with someone along with that. You know, we've been very humbled by the amount of five-star reviews we've gotten on the podcast. It really is, 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 is phenomenal to see. Uh, I know right now, I think we're almost at 60, uh, you know, reviews, which is phenomenal. And, and obviously we, yeah. We don't take that lightly by any stretch of the imagination. And, and it really does help with people, especially as they're first considering listening to the podcast. If they see the amount of five-star reviews that you have, it does make an impact on whether or not they decide to listen to, to you in the first place. And so, you know, one of our asks for, for you guys is to leave a five-star review. So if you, get, if you get a chance, you know, don't do this while you're driving. If it's, if you're doing something that requires hundred percent of your attention, please dedicate your time to that. But if, if you can, we would greatly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave us a five-star review. It does make a huge impact in our ability to reach a broader audience, and we would we great, greatly appreciate it. So, again, thank you all so much for listening, and we're looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about this particular episode. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the podcast. Well, hey, Sayo. Great to see you this fine afternoon. Great to see you also. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Where are you tuning in from? I am tuning in from the offices of Cushman and Wakefield in New York City, uh, right across the street from Rockefeller Center. Awesome. For, those, for, for those of you listening, you, it looks like, a, I don't know if it's atrium or just the center. Of the, I don't know what it is, but behind Sio, it, it's really nice looking. It's a building, great architecture, and uh, it's a nice yep. background there. So I appreciate it. And just adjacent, it's not in the shot, but uh, there is a view of uh, the 665th, which is one of the buildings we represent uh, that, nice. you know, recently, you know, being redeveloped in, uh, by Brookfield Properties. Uh, yeah, it's a really awesome asset. So it's awesome. right in yeah, the middle of it all. Yeah, New York City is awesome, man. Uh, I have several friends that live there right now, and, you know, I've visited many times and it's a it's a it's always it's always on which is a great great uh you know great environment to be in so um you know we're, well, like we're our obviously tri president would say you know mm -hmm. uh we're back right new york city is we're back so yeah no and, and we'll get into this later on in the discussion too i mean i'd love to get your take on you know the evolution since covid i, I was there actually in october of 2021 for a conference called cre tech uh yep. and that was that was you know, it was it was still it was much different than I remembered it just a few years before because I'd visited in 2019. And then when I visited, you know, back in 2021, I think that was before we started letting, you know, international travelers coming in uh, to more regularly. And so the streets f felt a lot less crowded. Uh, but I don't know if that that obviously has changed, I'm sure, since then. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, we're, we're getting back to some semblance of normalcy because, you know, New York City is, is a thriving metropolis and I hope it remains that way for years to come. So, yeah, definitely agree. I mean, you know, I believe that New York City is the pulse of where a lot of big and, uh, you know, innovative things happen. I think it continues to be that way. It's definitely different uh, from the times uh, pre-COVID in certain aspects, but I think the heart and soul of the city uh, still continues to, you know, keep on pumping the way that it did before. Absolutely, man, really. And and so what we typically do, right, when we when we first start in the podcast is we like to learn a little bit more about the person that's across the table from us. So if you don't mind kind of sharing who you are, your backstory, I think that'd be great. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Sayo Kamara. Uh, I've been at Cushman and Wakefield since January of 2021. I've been in the industry just about six years, uh, going uh, into my seventh. 
uh, and I came here from Texas originally. So I'm a Southerner by trade. Um, I was born and raised in Houston. Uh, I put myself through school uh, in Dallas. I went to the University of North Texas. Uh, and along that journey while uh, waiting tables to support myself financially, uh, I came across a commercial real estate broker and uh, that's where my spark for the business came. I was about 22 years old. I uh, had no idea what commercial real estate really was growing up outside of just seeing signs and windows. Uh, but, you know, quickly gained a liking with this person who came in uh, at a group uh, of a table. Uh, and uh, it was at Nick and Sam Steakhouse, uh, which the Dallas Cowboys love to go to. Uh, yes, I am a Cowboys fan, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that uh, astray for another <laughs> day. Um, but yeah, I, uh, you know, after having a conversation, I quickly realized, uh, in, you know, instead of going down, you know, more of a conventional path of being a banker or a lawyer, I thought brokerage would be an interesting career opportunity because I didn't have to sit at a desk. Uh, from nine to five, I had the autonomy to create my own schedule. I could, you know, do a suit and tie as we all used to wear ties. It seems like, uh, you know, ties are slowly fading away. Um, but then uh, also that, you know, there was no cap to earning potential. And that really stuck out to me as, uh, you know, it's, I've had to take an unconventional path, understand what I represent and uh, how things are a little bit uh, different from my journey. Um, but it's been uh, pretty, you know, awesome to transition into the commercial real estate business. Literally how uh, it happened was uh, I unfortunately missed out on an opportunity uh, to get an internship uh, because someone had an existing relationship uh, with the firm and they had never hired. Uh, and but at that time, they thought that I would be a great office broker. Um, so I started to lean into that, uh, having no idea what office real estate was. Uh, but I, uh, I, I while transitioning over to Capital Grill, uh, a woman who worked there for a very short time, her husband was a head of real estate for Chuck E. Cheese. Again, outside of knowing what Chuck E. Cheese was, I had no idea what he did, uh, but I'm never shy to connect with people. So I met him, uh, you know, really, uh, we hit it off and told him my situation. He said, if you're ever in New York, I'd love to connect you with a couple of guys. So I uh, purposely uh, made a vacation around the holiday season, uh, came up here and we hit it off and the guy said, hey, you wanna do commercial real estate, huh? And I was like, yeah. And he said, you wanna do New York? I said, absolutely. And he said, you're hired. We think you have what it takes. So um, it was a lot of risk that I took at that time. I never really thought about it until recently on how much that was. Uh, but yeah, I just basically packed up uh, and came up here, supported myself uh, by waiting tables at Capitol Grill here at the Chrysler building uh, at night. And I would go in and, you know, try and learn the business uh, cold with I came here with four bags and a dog uh, and thought that I was going <laughs> to be this rock star broker. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, just jumping through hoops and trying to put pieces together. Uh, and then, you know, I've definitely had some interesting uh, trajectories or, yeah, along the way of being here in the New York City area. Uh, and I would say some that happened, some events that happened over the last couple of years is what really put me in a place to uh, hone in and focus on, uh, you know, being a subject matter expert in, you know, a few uh, different parts of the business and really try and make a difference to open up doors for others. So, that's awesome. yeah, that's, that's very encouraging. I know for the brokers and real estate agents that are going in, you kind of have that fear that, you know, when you go into it, uh, what's going to happen and stuff, but to move from a different state and then go into the, one of the largest cities <laughs> to dive into it, that's, that's really encouraging. So everyone that's listening, it's like, Hey, Sile took the leap and he did it and he's successful. So you can too. So just keep striving there. So. Right. And I, I really did it with no financial backing. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's definitely uh, Impressive. easier ways to take it. But, you know, I said sink or swim. Uh, and the only way is swim. I had no connections. I remember I had 89 connections on LinkedIn. I didn't know a soul when I moved to New York. I had no friends here. I had no family connections for at least a thousand miles of a radius. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. possible. And, and it's, I, I think yeah. I think if anything, it just goes to show that the 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 this the, like you said the sink 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 or swim mentality. It's mm. like you know you're going to make it work regardless. I mean, and that's the type of mentality that 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 breeds success within the brokerage space is you have to have that you know can do attitude to get things done. And you know if you don't have the resources available, how are you going to make it work? Like you got to you got to do what you got to do to make it happen. And so obviously that 
that says a lot about you. And I mean, that's, that's one of the, probably the big reasons why you've had so much success early on in your career. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I think, uh, you know, the sink or swim mentality is probably even more necessary in today's environment. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the commercial real estate industry, but there's also a lot of flux, right? There's, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things and moving parts going on. I mean, you've seen industrial get really hot and then start to cool a bit. You've seen the office uh, industry, you know, sector uh, seem to still be uh, kind of like in a back and forth. There've been some players who have been very bullish throughout the entire uh, duration of COVID. And then you've seen some who have been very skittish. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, you know, where do you find that equilibrium? Uh, you know, retail has had a lot of different moving parts. So uh, you, I mean, thick skin is probably the first barometer for anyone, uh, you know, to be able yeah. to really consider being in the brokerage business if you want to thrive. Oh, absolutely. I, you, uh... I don't know where I was going with this, but you were saying that you wait at tables early on and you start waiting. How has that like being in a service industry helped you in your career now? So interestingly, while I've always enjoyed people, I was fairly shy early on uh, in my life. Um, you know, I think that what's interesting is one of the unique skill sets that you have, and I think it ties into the sink or swim mentality, is waiting tables, you work usually off of tips. So you're yeah. compensated every night based on how well you do in providing service, uh, which means that your personality has to be at top of game and you're dealing with a lot of competing personalities to be able to you know, uh, get the overarching goal, which is having satisfied guests, right? So over time and going through different facets of waiting tables, right? I worked at Chili's as my first waiting table job, right? To going into white tablecloth, which was casual fine. I worked at Tommy Bahama. And then I ultimately went to, you know, the uh, fine dining restaurants like Nick and Sam's and Capitol Grill. So along that dealing with a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, uh, walks of life, uh, coming through it really had me on my toes of understanding how to really think about the audience and like what people wanted and trying to lean more into that rather than focusing on what I wanted. Uh, so I had to yeah. be very outgoing. And I think that helped me become more empathetic towards understanding client needs today and trying to look behind the lens of what someone else needs outside of what I'm just ultimately trying to get, which is paid. I think I'm a big believer that serve first and the, you know, the results in return will come, uh, but you have to be yeah. a fiduciary in all levels. And so I think a lot of those intangibles happen. And again, that's why I thought commercial real estate was such a, a great path uh, for me, specifically in brokerage, uh, because you could take those skills and immediately transfer them over. That's awesome. Yeah. Fellow Chili's yeah. server. That was, that's how I got my start. I too. Love so it. I, uh, <laughs> that's, Maybe bad I mean, ribs. Yeah. I'm that's not going to do saying. the whole commercial thing, you know, and, uh, you know, we no. all know the slogan. <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, but but you know, some of the lessons I learned through those experiences, and I and I and I I worked at Chili's. I worked at you know smaller. You know, we I managed the restaurant a little bit after college because uh, I, I thought I wanted to be a restaurant tour, and I realized pretty quickly that was not what I what I yep. was yeah you know, cut out for. But you know, I you know the lessons that I learned in that industry are are, are immensely valuable. I, I mean, like you said, that the 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 interactions with people from a variety of walks of life and. And understanding, you know, what other people want, because there's some people like in, when you're interacting in a service environment where they don't want you to talk to them. They just want you to kind of exactly. do what they, they want you to just, you know, do what you need to do, get out, get in and get out. They don't want to they don't want to have to interact. But then there's others that that are that a lot more, require a little bit more time and attention. And obviously you get to read that and you get to read people. Um, and, and, and body language is, is obviously a big, big, uh, you know, valuable skill that you learn through those experiences as well. So. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't speak, speak more highly public speaking. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. We used to at Nick and Sam's, we had a whole tray where we had to memorize every single cut of meat that we would sell and we better have every single little line uh, out. Right. Or else if not, you would have to run food for the evening and you wouldn't be able to serve. So, I mean, I had to go through pretty intense training for things like that. And, you know, you'll have a table of 30 people and you'll have to, you know, speak and project in front of all of these folks and half the restaurants hearing you. Right. I mean, yeah. for me at that time, it was nerve wracking. 
but you know, being able to stretch my limits there. And over time and I started to learn, all right, I get comfortable with this. So, you know, like we're just people, right? Like you just have yeah. to be able to figure out folks moods and uh, you know, win folks over. So. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's, so that's great insight you shared. One thing that I was curious about is obviously you, you mentioned how you, you lived in Texas and then an opportunity presented itself and you're like, I'm packing my bags, bringing my dog along and I'm going to New York city. So you know, could you t- kind of describe some of those early struggles in that process? Because I can only imagine, you know, some of the some of the things you had to overcome, especially early on in your career. I mean, the, the commercial real estate bit industry is a brutal business, and I can imagine in New York City, it's even more amplified. So if you could share some of those insights, I think that'd be great. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think, as you said, right, New York City in itself is a different animal. I, I can't speak for other markets, but, uh, you know, even just finding apartments hard here, right? Uh, when I first uh, moved here, I initially did an Airbnb for my first month. So uh, I knew it was going to cost a little bit more, but I said, let me, you know, do this, buy a little time, figure out what I need to do, understand the process. And I didn't really understand how it worked, right? Um, I mean, here in New York, typically you need to make 40 times amount the amount of rent to even qualify, which is an insane number compared to other markets, right? So, um, you know, all of those different intangibles I had to learn pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, but it's a fast paced city, right? So you have to think off your feet and move quickly. Uh, so I ended up eventually transitioning to uh, an apartment, had roommates, did that whole thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of it, I just had to just, it was trial and error, right? Uh, a lot of trial and error. Uh, and I always had to think about what was next and think about four steps ahead as I made current decisions, which was a little overwhelming. So even when I did my internship, I had to really start to think about, OK, is this the place that I want to place my roots? If not, and I want to do something else or another opportunity presents itself, what could that look like? So I started going through the Rolodex of people that I didn't know of these 89 folks. And one person uh, I met was on uh, the board of a company that I ultimately transitioned to, which was Cressa, right? So I gave the guy a call, he connected me to one other person, and that's what ultimately got me uh, a full-time job to the next step. So, you know, obviously luck is uh, something that's a, a factor that happened in my journey and most people's journey as they go through, you know, uh, trajectories like this. However, it's always being prepared for that and knowing to strike when it presents itself. Um, so, uh, I think that those things were ultimately what helped me get to where I was. Uh, and then it wasn't until I got to the second full-time job, which was Collier's, where I started to conceptualize, honestly, what commercial real estate brokerage was like. In the beginning, I was just working all the time and I learned a little bit about the business, but you know, I eventually had to take more risk by saying, hey, I'm not going to uh, do uh, double dip by doing waiting tables and doing brokerage. I'm going to go 100% in, take you know a little bit less and live off of a draw, uh, and you know then just kind of like run with it and see what happens. So uh, that again is a, a point that I need, knew I needed to take a leap of faith, but I said I'm going to go all in, and that's when I started to understand more about the market, you know how transactions work, who the players are. Etc. cetera. Uh, and, you know, luckily I, I was able to transition over here to Cushman a year and a half ago uh, off of somewhat unfortunate circumstances, which is I lost my mentor uh, during COVID. He passed away unexpectedly. Oh, so, but in another lens though, uh, it was something that made me really think about, you know, who I am, what I wanted to do in the business and how I can make a difference. So um, that's where my glass half full side comes out. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to hear that about your mentor, yeah. but you know, I, I think it, it it's probably a testament to his, you know, impact on on your career and everything. The the you know the the fact that you've been able to do what you have in your in your early on in your career is, I mean, people finding people who are willing to pour into you as a professional is is life changing. Um, and I've had Absolutely. several mentors in my life, and you know, even though you know maybe there wasn't the the you know the the direct conversation where it's like, you're my mentor, that they've made an impact on me that I can only, you know, hope I can never hope to repay. But, you know, they're, they're, they're just, I, I think it just goes to show like the, the impact that mentors can have on people's careers. So, you know, obviously, go ahead. Go I, ahead say I, I was just gonna say, you know, uh, it's finding good people and finding the right people, right? I think that's ultimately essential in brokerage. Uh, you can be surrounded by 
people who are extremely talented at what they do, but if they're not, like you say, pouring into you in the right ways, uh, you could spin your wheels and not get anywhere, right? Um, I've seen it happen uh, and it's really unfortunate. So it's, you know, being surrounded by someone who has almost skin in the game to help you succeed, uh, that's where, you know, stickiness happens uh, and it becomes a mutually beneficial relationship because the more that you succeed, the more that they'll be champions for you. And, you know, from a senior broker's mentality, the more that they'll succeed, right? Um, but sometimes it gets, you know, a little <laughs> wishy-washy where it doesn't necessarily happen that way. And sometimes you can flame out. So, you know, I highly encourage anyone who's considering the business uh, to, you know, look for those who you can, it's almost a gut feeling you can sense actually is invested in your success and willing to show that earlier and not just willing to just take advantage of, you know, what you may have to offer in tangibly. Oh, absolutely. So as you were going through Colliers and you came to Cushman, when was it that you decided to focus on and what actually made you decide to focus on uh, office? in the, the real estate game? Yeah, so office has always been something that I've naturally gravitated towards. Uh, you know, I've enjoyed the end user side of office, right? So uh, being able to meet with CFOs of companies, COOs of companies, small and large. Uh, and it's, you know, very most of the time, uh, there's no or uh, very little emotion. Um, so it's like, hey, let's cut to the chase. Let's figure out what the bottom line is. Here's what our problem is go figure it out, right? Or uh, we need help with this. And so I think like that kind of clear cut mentality, uh, I operate well with. Um, I've yeah. always really enjoyed, uh, you know, being or being involved within advising clients that are on the institutional occupier space uh, and also nonprofits. Nonprofits have, you know, very significant challenges, uh, specifically in a market like this now where, you know, you're averaging over $75 a square foot. Uh, across the entire market. And I mean, you know, it's getting harder and harder to find those off market deals in the island of Manhattan. So, you know, some have to shift to Brooklyn or, you know, completely rethink their whole, uh, you know, strategy of, an, uh, you know, of their requirements. And, you know, thinking about how they serve community because I really value community. Uh, I've enjoyed working with them also. So um, those are the things where I figured out I really wanted to hone uh, my craft in and spend time on that. Um, but you know, I, uh, I've always loved office, uh, and I've dabbled in some of the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, verticals and what I think like it's, uh, ultimately, uh, important. And what I've really enjoyed about being at Cushman is being able to provide our platform as services. Uh, so even if there's something that may not be directly in my wheelhouse, I can be able to bring the right people because I'm a firm believer we have the best in class when it comes to talent. I mean, we have the best capital markets team in the entire country here, right? And they are sitting on a floor above me. Like that's pretty awesome potential. Yeah. And we can be able to cross pollinate and cross sell, uh, which is awesome to be a part of. And it's something that I really enjoy being at Cushman and Wakefield for. Well, that's awesome, man. No, yeah. And 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 it kind of, you know, kind of you kind of referenced the the gravitation towards a particular property type. You know, when I first started in the business, I didn't have any concept of what commercial real estate was and just going through the process of, of going through different types of deals. I also started nationally gravitating more towards actually the retail side. So I've done a lot more yeah. on the retail end uh, and then I'm at a boutique brokerage and we do a little bit of everything, but I've, I've noticed my focus areas started to really gravitate towards retail because I love the retail space and I love interacting with business owners that are starting a variety of different types of businesses, love, love learning about you know, all the different nuances of each of these individuals' businesses. And that's one of the big reasons why I like retail. And obviously in your case, you love interacting on the institutional end when, when it comes to clients that you work with and also on the nonprofit side. So, you know, it, again, it's one of those things where there's a little bit of everything in the commercial real estate business. It's just yep. kind of where do you gravitate towards, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I also think that as you go by too, it's, uh, it's also understanding how to follow what trends are that might be short, what trends might be longer. Uh, and, you know, also understand again, what the audience is looking for. 
So there's been certain things that I've been, uh, you know, trying to understand more about when it comes from the audience, uh, audience's perspective. And there's been a few things in there where, you know, I believe that Cushman and Wakefield is doing a great job from, uh, from a corporate standpoint and being able to articulate that message to our clients. So that way we find the right audiences that are also aligned with that. Uh, I think that that's uh, something that I've really enjoyed being a part of and want to help expand the company's efforts on. That's awesome, man. No, really. Yeah. And and so one of the things I'm kind of curious about is obviously we're, we're talking about office office properties and, and you know, with COVID kind of hopefully being in the rearview mirror, you know, there has been a, a, a significant evolution of office really around the country. But I'm kind of interested to hear your take on, you know, where you see the evolution going in a post-COVID world. Obviously, New York City is one of the major office markets in the world. So I was kind of curious if you could share your insights on that front. Yeah. So, I mean, look, you know, uh, it's, I think there's still a lot that's left to be determined, right? Um, You know, this is an over 400 million square foot office market, Uh, you know, and it's extremely dense. Uh, You know, I mean, the island of Manhattan is only a pair over 14 miles of distance. Uh, So there's a large concentration of space within, you know, a sort of a very small subsection. Uh, You know, I believe, at least from what I've seen and heard, that employers are looking to have employees back in the office. The more in the office, the better. However, employees, uh, interestingly, don't want to be in the office. And uh, it's very surprising to see how, at first, the excuse used to be because of safety reasons with with COVID, which is obviously, uh, you know, understood and important. But now that that's becoming less of the forefront of a message, it just seems like it's now what, you know, the majority of the workforce is, which is mostly our demographic and younger, uh, is looking for a different experience. So, you know, the word flight to quality is obviously used a lot here. We've seen a lot of activity move towards those spaces, you know, so what I'm saying right now is not anything, you know, uh, flashy, but, you know, uh, when it comes to the point of, you know, buildings that are class B and class C product, they're going to have to have a really innovative strategy on figuring out how to compete uh, because those buildings, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons are having a hard time filling up because it's not necessarily where the audience is wanting to go at this space. Maybe that will change once, you know, a little bit more of new construction starts to fill uh, and the competition is so fierce, you have to get uh, creative in different ways. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Um, You know, I this is where my controversial piece would come from when it when it comes to uh, returning to the office. I think that, you know, we've had discussions about, um, you know, returning to the office uh, on a hybrid schedule three days a week. Right totally fair. But maybe what we might need to do is get rid of the Friday as the workday, right? I mean, you know, in a lot of spaces outside of our industry, which, you know, tends to have a lot of people that go in on a regular basis, you know, there's not a lot of people who tend to go in the office at all on Friday, or if so, they end their days on Friday. Historically, summer has always been that way. So I believe if you are able to, you know, remove Friday as a work day, <coughs> sorry, remove Friday as a work day, um, or uh, yeah, and then you were able to give that back to employees and then potentially subsidize a portion of their commuting costs, I think that that will be much more of a, uh, you know, a point where you can lure employees to want to come to the office a portion of the time. I mean, and, you know, and I think that that would help foster productivity. We all agree that, you know, there's an element of the office space that needs to uh, still be there, uh, which is obviously shifting. But I think if you did that, that's almost a negotiating tactic where I think both parties can be satisfied, where you get uh, employees to show up in the space and, uh, you know, do their work a portion of their time, but also employees feel like they have some autonomy over their work-life balance. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can even potentially stagger it to where you have people working on a Tuesday to Friday schedule and then others Monday through Monday through Thursday, which gives you the fill of the entire work week and everything as well. But, you know, I think that's a very innovative way to to think of it. And, you know, I know I know Apple just released uh, a statement saying they're going to have their employees go back to the office uh, three days a week. Uh, One of my good buddies works at Apple. And so 
You know, I, I think that's a trend that we're going to probably start seeing uh, happen pretty regularly uh, in the coming months and years. But, um, you know, like you said, I, it, it, we're, it's going to be interesting to see because if you're an employee that works at this company and another company says, you know, hey, you know, you don't have to come in the office. Is that enough of a, of a draw to, to kind of lure away the talent? And as we know, in industry all across the world, it's a war for talent. So yeah. that's that's the thing is it. it Historically, it's always been the 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 entrepreneurs or the owners of businesses who have really been the driving force as to what you know you know desires or needs are within the office environment. It was kind of a top down approach, but now with the demand for top talent being so strong, it, it may just invert. I mean, it's already kind of you're kind of seeing that already. But yeah, and I think that you know, whatever our standard approach to the return of office, it's probably going to take even longer than we've thought, right? We thought it was going to be between, you know, last fall and this summer that there would be a drastic move. There's been some move towards something, uh, but because now we are as humans creatures of habit uh, and one way has worked for the last two and a half years, can't believe I'm saying it has been that long, but yeah. you know, I think that that's, it's still going to be some time before we get to a point of having some standard strategy for it. Just because like you said, right. One employer says one thing, another employer says another. And when these larger employers do that, that creates no consistency across the board. So, you know, while there might be a, a move of the needle to some extent, but because there's been a lot of shifting, I think that, people are more, or I'm sorry, employers are more, uh, you know, or less adapt to just jumping at things sometimes. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in the market right now. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I harp to a lot of our clients is that, you know, take advantage of it while you can, because uh, when it comes to class A product, uh, we've seen nothing but an increase. Uh, and, you know, with construction costs, supply chain, challenges going along it sounds like it's going to continue to be the case yeah in the construction industry I've, there's been several companies that i know of in different states around the u.s that actually they went to a four-day work week um to give their employees that three days off uh and they just do four tens um uh, and they just work straight through and everyone that's done it they seem like all the employees just love it so your idea dsao i think will would go over great for most people in any industry, I believe. But, um, I, and I, earlier you spoke of like some initiatives of nonprofit philanthropy and stuff that with, within Cushman, I know that you're passionate about some of those initiatives. Can you, uh, elaborate on that for us and let us know what you're passionate about? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, when it comes to community things, you know, part of my yeah. background, because I didn't come, uh, in a traditional path in the commercial real estate, I tried a lot of different things and I honestly had no exposure. I feel like I learned a little bit about it late. Uh, I'm all, always thinking about how to empower the next generation and create that exposure early. Uh, specifically when it comes to marginalized communities, uh, there's a lot of folks out there who don't even understand what brokers is or know a lot about what you know opportunities there are uh, because yeah. You know, traditionally, I, th I feel like most people uh, see commercial brokerage as suit and tie and office space, right? But there's so many different avenues uh, to open up. So I actually run the junior board for the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club here. Uh, and, um, you know, th they obviously spend a lot of time with underprivileged youth. Uh, so figuring out different ways to create sparks in uh, communities that uh, typically haven't been represented in commercial real estate, uh, but clients are looking for, right? It's a unique way of uh, figuring out how to uh, bridge the gap. It's a more longer term strategy. Um, and then also uh, for part of my professional uh, endeavors is I serve on the board of the Young Men's and Women's Real Estate Association here, which is a group mostly comprised of owners, brokers, and developers who you know talk about different policies and we promote different policies as uh, a lot of our members are part of the real estate board in New York. But then also uh, we spend a lot of time actively engaged in the community uh, by doing things with uh, specific partnerships uh, such as Rebuilding Together New York, uh, Volunteers of America historically, uh, and we uh, you know do business together. So it's a 
you know, it's a group that uh, is a very well esteemed uh, professionals who have uh, gone off to do extremely uh, uh, well and uh, done some really significant, been a part of some really significant projects in the city. Um, so also thinking again, how do we engage the next generation of talent uh, in a unique way to join the group and also participate and uh, find their own pathways to success. So that's that. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. No, and 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 obviously that's that's phenomenal that you're doing that. And 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 you know, it, I think I think in 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 any any person's career, I think it's important to think about ways that you can give back to others. Yeah. And, and and obviously the 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 focus area of of what you decide to give back to is really just dependent on the person in particular. I mean, whether you're you know you you know you you focus on you know children for for you know financial education like I've I've done through you know the, uh, you know, uh, junior achievement and various other things, or if you're focusing on the boys and girls club or, or really any other organization that, that does provide help to, to a variety of different people. I think it's just important to consider that, uh, in, in, in your life, because we're part of the reason we're here, in my opinion, is to be of service to others. Um, and I think that that's amazing that you do that on a regular basis. So, yeah, yeah I, I think it's ultimately important, right? I mean, you know, talent is fierce, Right. Um, and I think that there are a lot of potentially, you know, or there's a lot of talent out there that has the capability to make a great difference uh, in this business. Right. And I think with that, uh, we have to think creatively to ca capture those audiences because commercial real estate, uh, you know, has uh, to compete with all of these other bright and great companies that are out there in society, oh, right? Yeah. So, you know, what is it that we're going to do different to, you know, try and be as engaging as, uh, you know, these other industries that talent is looking to be a part of. So. Yeah. Absolutely. No, yeah, it's more. great. Yeah. So one of the things obviously you kind of alluded to through kind of the discussion points on, on the philanthropic side is, you know, diversity within brokerage because this is one thing that you know i've noticed uh just getting into the brokerage side of things it's not the most diverse uh industry at all um and so one of the things that i'm kind of curious about on your front is you know what what are some of the ways you think that we can be a little bit more you know um appealing to a broad base of people from all different walks backgrounds colors and creeds because it is an important part of making sure that the business itself brings in people with a variety of different ideas and, and continues to prosper long-term. So I, I wanted to kind of ask you on that front. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it's a facet of things. I mean, one of the things that brought me over to Cushman and Wakefield uh, was noticing how much diversity there is at the top. Right. So, you know, we have, we're comprised of a board that is, you know, over 40% female. Um, that's pretty amazing. We also hired, a chief diversity officer from an under, another industry uh, to, you know, run our global practice for our diversity efforts. Um, you know, we have a portion of our C-suite, which does sit here in our New York office. And in the past year and a half, I've been fortunate to meet the entire C-suite, uh, you know, uh, in, for different purposes. Uh, most importantly, I met with our global CEO uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we had a roundtable discussion and there were maybe five to seven other professionals in that room. And I was one of them uh, being able to speak directly with our global CEO about DE&I practices. Uh, and when I say that it's important from the top, it is important from the top. And being able to understand that and have the accessibility to that is ultimately important. Uh, and so I think like, you know, it's examples like that, which is what needs to be out more. I think that we all as a community or as a industry need to do a better job of practicing what we preach and being able to also, um, you know, uh, get out the message of what we are doing, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's stuff like that. I think there's also, it's just being intentional about ensuring that talent specifically of marginalized communities who come into a business where they might have no points of connection, uh, it, you know, get proper mentorship, right? Uh, you know, real commercial real estate brokerage uh, has a hard time of being able to create structured success paths, right? Most of the time, it's either smile and dial or you have connections to be able to build your practice. 
uh, you know, with the way that our clients are becoming now, uh, there's a much, much more need for a lot of intangibles, such as being able to, you know, understand underwriting and a pro forma. And, you know, there's more of an analytical approach. And I think it's also getting to the point, since it's so consultative now, to be able to deliver on platform services rather than being just office right or just retail it's being able to speak on how you can work across uh, or you, how the firm can be able to service across different things because there might be multiple facets where you can uncover opportunity for folks and again being able to equip the next generation of talent early on with those tools to understand how to properly market that when it's some a muscle that they probably have never been able to exercise and i think uh, you know another part of it is that when it comes to talent that already exists that does represent communities that traditionally don't exist there, giving them the opportunity to really succeed, be brand ambassadors and, uh, you know, and make money, right? Give them opportunities to make money specifically through brokerage. Without that, I think that it's harder for those groups to be able to go back out and say, hey, you know, I uh, think that this industry is awesome. You can be successful. Oh, by the way, I'm still trying to figure it out for myself too. <laughs> You know, like that doesn't really, that's not as much of a story as like saying, hey, here's what I've been able to do to make it. Here's how I did it. Here's how you can participate. I think that message is much stronger. Uh, and I think, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to young kids of different communities. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them see things in quick cash situations. Uh, while this is such a long term game, specifically in brokerage, there are bits and pieces and elements of, you know, the hustle that I think that if you can be able to articulate that well, there are there's a lot of talent that would be interested in giving it a shot. But, you know, just, a, hey, give you a phone, you know, give you a draw and say, look, you accumulated a whole bunch of student loan debt. Uh, and then all of a sudden now you're leaving from that and then jumping into a business and you're going to accumulate more debt. I mean, that's just that that mentality is going to have to change if you want to have a different subset of folks and it's not to say that the existing subset you know shouldn't exist i'm just saying that like to be able to capture a larger audience there's got to be a more intentional strategy to you know doing so no 100 percent. no I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying and i think i think obviously that comes through the 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 putting yourself in another person's shoes and sometimes it's hard to really understand people's perspective when you really haven't ever had any type of experience that they've had in their, in their life. And so, you know, th that's why I think it's so important to have these types of discussions. That's why, you know, we're obviously honored to have you on the podcast to continue to share this type of stuff, because, you know, I think the more we talk about it, the more that people take actual action and initiative in the, in the direction, that's when we're actually going to see, you know, positive change over time. And, and, it, and it, it, it does take time to do it, but I'm, I'm glad yep. that we're able to kind of have the discussion. So. Well, just to add to that, too, I think one of the most important things when it comes to diversity in itself is seeing it from a philanthropic lens. If that is the way that we approach it, I think that we're dead when it comes mm -hmm. to doing that. I don't you know, believe that diversity is a philanthropic effort. Diversity is not only, you know, the right thing to do. It's also good for business. Right. You know, our demographics in society are changing. Our clients are looking for this right to be able, again, to compete with the best and brightest of winning business with other companies. You have to find ways to adapt. And I think that those who focus on trying to capture those audiences and give them the opportunities to grow now and be able to mirror what the clients are uh, from a lot of different buckets. I think those are going to be the trailblazers and those are the ones that are going to be the leaders of the next generation of business uh, because it's good for business. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the strategic recruiting, right? That's, I think a lot of people, even uh, some guests we had in the past were talking about how they were strategizing to diverse uh, and, and recruit that uh, sector of, you know, diversity and stuff like that. So their, their whole strategy and system was rebuilt completely from the ground up uh, on the recruiting efforts. And it sounds like Cushman and Wakefield are leading the way on that. It sounds like, so I can't wait to see how that, uh, what transpires from that, you know, how, how your workforce changes and everything and see what happens. So absolutely um, yeah and we yeah. we had the we had the president of sior uh come on the podcast a while back and he had talked about you know the initiatives that sir was taking as well so 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that Cushman and Wakefield has, uh, you know, a lot of potential uh, to be the next leader. Um, and, you know, stay tuned. We, there's a lot of, a lot of thought, effort, uh, and initiative towards doing this in a thoughtful way, not just saying, hey, you know, we're going to put a diverse face there just because uh, yeah. we want to put the best talent out there. Oh, by the way, they happen to be diverse. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that that story is uh, one that's going to be great to tell. And, you know, we'll, uh, we look to, you know, showcase more uh, client wins uh, and successes that come behind those efforts. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so I always, it's been great having you on here and learning your background and your story and uh, how you just took that chance and that huge leap and drove, flew, hopped, skipped, and jumped a thousand miles away to <laughs> land in New York to do this adventure. Um, but man, it, it's been awesome. And so one of the rounding out questions for our podcast is we ask all of our guests because Raphael and I both read a lot. Uh, I know a lot of the guests as well, they do the same, but one of the question is what are the most impactful book that you've ever read? And it doesn't have to pertain to commercial real estate. It can be uh, business or anything uh, that's maybe changed your career trajectory or your thought process or just. Yeah. So there's that's... a couple uh, that come to mind. One is sure. a recent read. It's uh, by Sylvia Hewlett, I believe. Uh, and it's called executive presence, right? So it speaks a lot about, you know, understanding how to present as an executive, how executives speak, uh, and, you know, just a little bit of the intangibles of what it takes to reach that level. Uh, I was gravitated by that just because I spent a lot of time speaking to executives. Uh, so being able to, you know, again, understand the audience uh, and, you know, present myself in a way that uh, best aligns with that, uh, that's also true to who I am. Uh, without changing. So I think that that's really important. Uh, one that I thought was interesting was this book called Understanding Yourself. Uh, and it's by Harvey Coleman. Uh, so it was a African American, uh, you know, a, a corporate professional who thought that there were uh, a glass ceiling for him to be able to succeed. And then he quickly understood that there were tools to the game. And reading the book helped me understand how to uh, you know, navigate corporate, the corporate world in a certain sense, uh, and be able to, again, be true to myself without, uh, losing sight of who I am, but also understand, you know, that there is a game to be played. Uh, and you know, I'm all for playing the game. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to, to, win. to win. Oh, you have to. Yeah, of yeah. course. And then, you know, like you said, in a corporate structure, I mean, there, there are, there are rules to the game and you've got to learn how to navigate the, 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 the different nuances of it. And, you know, I think it's important uh, to, to realize that that's the case, uh, especially if you want to eventually become a top executive, which I'm sure, you know, your aspirations are that point uh, to, to that trajectory. That's awesome. Well, man, dude, we greatly appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was very insightful and I'm really glad we were able to connect. Uh, one thing we typically ask at the end of the podcast episode is what we, we like to have our guests contribute to something, what we call the commercial real estate treasure chest. It's a repository of resources that we make available to our audience. And we've had people contribute helpful PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, really just anything that they feel would be of value to the audience. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share what you're willing to contribute today. Yeah, so I, I mean... You know, there's uh, different things. Uh, you know, I think s some stuff that talks about returning to the office, uh, I'm happy to contribute to that. Uh, I'm happy to, I, there was an article that does speak about my story. It was at my prior employer, but I think that that's something that uh, I've really appreciated. Uh, and other things that I would want to uh, contribute are things that are things that I've read that I think are really important. Um, and they're probably in PDF form, uh, which speak about, as a matter of fact, the one is uh, from my mentor, which spoke about diversity and uh, how, you know, the industry could do better. I'm happy to share that also. Because I thought great. it was really important. It literally yeah. came out four weeks before he passed away, which was really unfortunate because he was a huge advocate in that effort. But, uh, you know, there's all of those little nuggets are things that we can use to learn and move on from. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. I'm, sh I'm sure our audience will appreciate that. So thank you again for yeah. being willing to contribute to that. And Sayo, right. again... I really appreciate you coming on, man. It's been it's been wonderful and great. And I know our listeners and viewers as well will want to reach out to you. Uh, so what avenue of contact would you like them to reach out to you? Um, 
Yeah, you can always shoot me an email. Uh, best way to find me though is LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. Uh, it's the easiest way for me to keep up with folks. Um, if you want me to respond back in a quick manner, uh, LinkedIn is uh, probably the best way. Perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, it's going to be in the description. So we'll include his link uh, for his LinkedIn in the description. And if you guys are watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description as well. So feel free to connect with him and uh, you know, I'm sure he'll be able to provide you with additional value that he's already provided on this podcast. So Sayo, again, thank you so much for, for stopping by uh, for those, for those of you guys who are listening to this in a podcast format, we would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a five star review. It makes us a huge difference in our, in our impact and our reach as far as our audiences are concerned. Along with that, if you guys are watching this on a uh, YouTube format, we would greatly appreciate it if you can like and subscribe to this channel. It really makes a difference with the YouTube algorithm and ensures more and more people can hear this message and learn about the many facets of commercial real estate. So thank you all so much for stopping by and we'll see you all next time. We'll be right back.